Okay, members, the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Health. We will start with the list of questions. Uh, first of all, questions five and seven are withdrawn. And I call on Alex Easton to ask the first question. Mr Easton. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Minister. I thank the member for his question. I fully appreciate that every patient should be able to avail of the best treatment that the health service can provide, and in a timely manner. It is regrettable that any patient has to wait longer than is clinically appropriate for outpatient assessment, and I fully understand the distress and anxiety that long waiting times cause, particularly when patients are suffering pain and discomfort. And I can assure you that waiting times for elective care remain a key priority for the health service in Northern Ireland. Elective care activity, unfortunately, had to be reduced during the first wave of the pandemic as medical staff were redeployed to treat COVID-19 patients. This inevitably had an adverse impact on outpatient waiting times, which prior to the pandemic were already unacceptable. As part of the process to rebuild HSC services in the wake of the first wave of COVID-19, I published the Rebuilding HSC Services Strategic Framework in June. The framework outlines HSC's plans to rebuild health and social care and sets out the approach of resetting elective activity in an environment which is safe for both staff and patients while planning for a second wave of COVID-19. In developing these plans, trusts have taken account of the new innovative practices that have introduced, been introduced during the first wave of the pandemic. For example, trusts have adopted the use of technology such as telephone and virtual clinics to a much greater extent. Outpatient appointments have, where possible and where appropriate, moved to telephone appointments. And in addition, a growing number of specialties are adopting virtual clinics using video conferencing. Embedding these recent innovations will be essential to maximise outpatient activity during a second wave of the pandemic. It is important to emphasise that the impact of COVID-19 on elective care services will be profound and long-lasting. It has been acknowledged that services will not be able to resume as normal for some time due to the constraints imposed by COVID-19, including social distancing and the use of PPE. In recent weeks, the increasing prevalence of COVID-19 positive cases in the community and our hospitals is impacting on the rebuilding of elective services. Staff are being redirected to respond to these pressures or are required to self-isolate and, as a consequence, some cancellations have been required, and this may continue in the short to medium term. This will inevitably have an adverse impact on outpatient waiting times for some time to come. Thank you. Can I just could remind the Minister that there are two minutes to answer a question, and if the Minister believes you have need to extra time, you can get an extra minute, but we just have to try and keep this uh, consistent for all of the departments. So, uh, Alex Eason, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I thank the Minister for his answer? Minister, even, even before COVID and even before his time, the waiting lists have been a disaster for an absolute ages before all this. Um, would the Minister agree with me that it's going to be incredibly hard to get the waiting lists down, especially when we don't have enough nurses? Um, we don't have enough doctors, and even with independent sector providers' help, um, the waiting lists were hardly moving even, even before this. What can we do more collectively together to try and get this down once we get through the COVID pandemic? Um, and I thank the member for, for a supplementary. Uh, speaker, before I move on to the answers to that, can I thank uh, Mr Easton for his service on the Health Committee? I am led to believe that he will be moving to to another more important committee uh, sometime in the next weeks, but as a member who has served on that committee since 2007, can I thank him for his service, his dedication and his detailed knowledge, as we have seen in the question that he has actually asked, because his writing is a, is a subject he has often raised, is the lack of numbers of nurses and doctors within our current system. When this place came back on the 11th of January, one of our big achievements was to put 300 nursing places, uh, training places every year for the next three years. The member himself highlighted many times that that would not even fill the gap that we currently have. So it is about filling the gap in the staffing vacancies, but also um, embedding those creative uh, and innovative solutions that we have seen the, the establishment of mm -hmm. the, the elective care centre in Lagan Valley, the orthopaedics network, the cancer reset cell. It is about looking outside what has been the norm within our health services. It is about breaking down the silos that we had. Um, not intentionally created, but artificially created within the system, uh, where we didn't look across all our trusts, all our services, to see how we could react um, collectively to challenging the waiting lists, to looking at waiting lists, 
and actually challenging um, the surgeons, the doctors and the health professionals to travel to other sites as well, which after a meeting with the Royal College of Surgeons and other health professionals last week, there is an indication that to really get to grips with the, with the waiting times that we have, they're prepared to do that. Thank you, Nicole. Dolores Kelly. Speaker um, and Minister, are you aware, Minister, that last night there were over 100 people waiting in the emergency department of Craigavon Area Hospital and I understand Daisy Hill Hospital as well, and whether or not he has had any evaluation, uh, uh, because I understand people are finding it hard to contact their GP, that people are choosing again to use emergency department instead of uh, the outpatients or indeed their GP because of that breakdown across the system or the difficulties that each area is experiencing. Look, the, the pressures even in our emergency departments are, are, are historic. There was a piece of work put into, into place about how that was to be reviewed. Uh, I announced on Friday that that is now available on the, on the, on the department's website and how we look at the, the reformation of our, of, our, of our emergency care services. And it, it, it's going to be a challenge as well, especially at this time, because one of the things that we're actually doing um, through our urgent emergency care action plan and, the No More Silos plan um, is actually how we can work across all our services. And one of the things we've really seen um, in the last six months is how primary and secondary care has really come together to work collaboratively. That's been demonstrated at our COVID centres, and it's also something that is vital that we continue into this this next phase. You know, and, and how we look at our emergency care system is, you know, there, there's ten key actions laid, laid out and that no more silence action plan for keeping emergency departments for emergencies, you know, the rapid access to assessment and treatment services, 24-7 telephone clinical uh, assessment service, you no know, phone first. You know, some of the things that we're seeing being introduced in, in Daisy Hill is it's been reopened you know, in, that, in the emergency care there. So it's how we utilise uh, a very limited staff uh, on, a, on a smaller footprint uh, because of social distancing, but making sure that we can get patients to be seen by the right person at the right time and in the right place. I call Pat Sheehan. Kian Corlog is Puyak and Selecionara, Sokta Aragra. Thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, many people are very concerned about the cancellation or pausing of outpatient services. And I wonder could the Minister tell us how he's going to prioritise pressing and urgent cases, particularly in neurology and in pain clinics? Um, as the member um, is aware, I'm, I'm sure aware there, there's a number of royal colleges um, issued a joint press statement this morning. I've been meeting with them, the department's been meeting with them about how we re-engage and make sure some of the services that we put in place in our research plans continue on the, ple the, the pain clinics, the neurology services as well, as well as our urgent flags for cancers as well. But this will be dependent on, on the availability of staff and the availability of premises. And I think the Royal College is in their press release this morning summed it up, summed it up better than, than I think any of us can in regards to the fact that there, you know, the pressures on services, and this is to quote their press release, pressures on services are already growing rapidly, and GP surgeries, emergency departments are coming under increased strain to safely meet demands from patients. With elective care waiting lists and unacceptable levels already, it is essential that every single person in Northern Ireland complies with the government guidance to help stop the virus from spreading so that staffing and financial resources aren't pulled from routine operations and treatments. So that responds as well to what the member is asking for. The more of our health professionals we can keep concentrated on what uh, their specialities are so that we don't have to divert them uh, to COVID services is all the better for the people of Northern Ireland. So that's why it's vital, as the Royal Colleges are asking this morning, are asking in their press release, that the people of Northern Ireland really respond and react to the asks of government guidance so we can drive down the spread of COVID-19. Next question, Justin McNulty. Question two. Um, and again, thank the member for his question. <coughs> COVID-19 has undoubtedly have, had has had a severe impact on diagnostic treatment services. However, urgent cancer diagnostics and treatment were delivered during the first wave and will continue to be delivered during the second surge as safely as possible in COVID-19 safe spaces and using the independent sector hospitals where appropriate. The COVID-19 surge planning strategic framework provides the overall structure and parameters within HSC thrusts 
and they will develop further plans for managing the response of COVID-19 in the event of further waves. This framework can be viewed on the Department's website. Lessons learned from the first surge of coronavirus, combined with the aforementioned regional approach, have the potential to continue to improve resilience against COVID-19. However, we should be under no illusion that there are challenging times ahead. Services are already coming under pressure, and as the number of COVID positive inpatients increases, this will have a negative impact on the ability to maintain other services. One of my primary aims is the difficult, in the difficult weeks ahead will be to ensure the continued delivery of high quality diagnosis and cancer services, providing, of course, that is safe to do so. Justin McNulty, supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Minister, there are chinks of light amidst all the doom and gloom, and the reopening of breast cancer surgery in Daisy Hill Hospital for the first time in 10 years is something to be hugely celebrated, and the reopening of our ED, notwithstanding the issues around to Kirin last night. But, Minister, I need to clear an interest here. I have been in touch with you about this before. My own aunt, who has had her, her life-changing operation postponed twice now, just a matter of days before her operation. She is not the only one on that boat. There are multiple women and men who are waiting at home, who are scared, who are frightened that their operation is going to be postponed, that their operation has already been postponed. What comfort, what reassurance can you give them, Minister? What support has been provided to your department from the Department of Finance to make sure you have all the resources in place to ensure that nobody is waiting at home and no more operations are postponed, and that the diagnostics are in place to ensure there isn't a future pandemic as a result of this pandemic? You know, and, and the member I think articulates um, that sense of frustration, of hurt, and of anxiety that many families do um, across this province when we have had to, to cancel surgeries and diagnosis and screening programmes as well. And, but I would say to the member, it's not simply at this point in time about throwing money at my department. The, it's, it's the nurses I need, it's the staff I need, it's those trained clinicians. Uh, one of the largest impacts that we have. The more people that we have going into ICU, the more need we have of anaesthetists moving from theatres and to support those people who are being put, on, put onto ventilation and onto ventilators as well. From those highly skilled theatre nurses that are then trans, transformed and transposed into supporting those additional ICU beds as well. So every ICU bed that we have to open, that we have to support through staff, has that knock-on effect. So when the member mentions you know, the surgeries that are now potentially going to be taking part in Daisy Hill. That's where we look to our proactive and reactive service, that we start to utilise our footprint around the province, no matter where it is. It used to be at the start, when I came into this place, the biggest cry was, you know, patients wouldn't travel. They always wanted the service on their doorstep. Patients are now willing to travel. Our surgeons are willing to travel. Our nurses are willing to travel. But what I really want to do is stop the travel, stop the spread, and stop the contamination of COVID-19 in this society. By doing that, it allows me to release more of those frontline critical service health workers back to the jobs and, and the service delivery where they should be delivering that, and that's like the likes of services for your own for your own. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, can the minister provide an update to the House on cancer screening programmes? Um, I, I thank the member um, for his point because it, it is one of the the more challenging uh, aspects, especially in regards to, to where we were in the first wave. Um, the bowel, breast and cervical cancer screening programmes were paused um, from mid-March to the end of June in 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And restoration of all paused screening programmes has recommenced. The immediate priority is to clear the backlog of patients waiting for diagnostic procedures and to issue invitations to those whose screening opportunities were paused. This has been happening over the summer and good progress has been made. A key aim over the, the coming month is to develop a screening contingency plan and that will outline the measures and steps necessary to maintain population screening during a resurgence of COVID over the months ahead. It is likely to take some time for screening services to return to pre-COVID levels and inevitably, inevitably the pace of rebuilding will also be influenced by the progress of the pandemic. The need to maintain social distancing and clinical settings, the implementation of enhanced infection control measures, and the continued requirement for personal protective equipment will also present challenges for service restoration. Dealing with the pandemic continues to create additional pressures on health services. However, with the context 
uh, the recovery and restoration of screening services remains a priority. It is vitally important that anyone who has experienced any of the symptoms associated with early stage cancer should contact their doctor rather than waiting for a screening test. Call Paula Bradshaw. Um, I'm just wondering, Minister, given how critical time is um, in terms of cancer, are you uh, intending to um, use the independent sector more in the winter to bring the, the waiting list down and waiting times down? Thank you. Um, and you know, I, I think the member we did use, we did utilise the independent sector um, during the first wave, and it would be my intention to do that again, um, because given the impact of COVID-19 on the HSC operating capacity and the significant reduction in HSC productivity as a result, um, they have continued to require access to the independent sector capacity to deliver core services. The Health and Social Care Board, on behalf of the HSC, entered into contracts with three independent hospital providers um, from the 1st of April to the 29th of June. Uh, these contracts were agreed on a not-for-profit, full-cost recovery basis and provided trusts with full access to these independent sector hospital facilities. Um, this arrangement did cease on the 29th of June as the independent sector moved uh, to restart their services to insured and privately funded patients. Uh, the theatre capacity has been prioritised for category Q cancer patients, uh, and that is from the 20, 29th of June to the 20th of September. In addition to the above, um, 1 point, or sorry, 12.1 million non-recurring funding has also been avail made available for 2021 for elective care and has been targeted in the first instance, incidence at patients with the highest clinical risk who are waiting on a diagnostic test, including those with suspected or confirmed cancer. In the main, this activity will be undertaken by the independent sector providers. Call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Data and evidence is important. The Minister may be aware that the Office of National Statistics showed that for England, non-COVID deaths have soared between March and September. Diabetic deaths up 86 per cent, prosthetic cancer deaths up 53 per cent, breast cancer deaths up 47 per cent. Sadly and undoubtedly COVID kills, but so does lockdown. Has the Minister any data relating to the non-COVID impact on Northern Ireland? Um, and I, th I thank the member uh, for, for his point, and I think I welcome him to, to the Health Committee. I think he's taken over um, from Mr Easton. Uh, in regards to the, the data that is there, um, he will be aware that the um, NISRA produces a weekly um, update on a Friday in regards to the excess deaths related and above cancer as well. They, they have done, as the official recorder of statistics in Northern Ireland, they are doing a breakdown and have done a breakdown on the additional deaths and the, the cause of death in regards for the information that is actually held uh, on death certificates as well. So they do that breakdown and they provide that data to my department. Next question, Mr William Urban. Mr. Speaker, uh, question number three. Again, um, I, I thank the member um, for his question. Demographic pressures and the misalignment of demand against funded capacity have created challenges across many aspects of elective surgery, including that required for cataract surgery. It was for this reason that the Department moved to establish elective care centres, now called day procedure centres. These centres will provide high-volume, non-complex surgical treatments and procedures working across traditional trust boundaries to act as a resource for the region to improve access and reduce waiting lists. Cataract surgery was identified as a prototype model, and three elective care centres for cataract surgery were established in December 2018, offering assessments and treatments at Down, Mid Ulster and the South Tyrone hospitals. The centres are designed to improve flow whilst maintaining quality and safety with the efficiencies gained uh, aimed at improving productivity and reducing waiting lists. COVID has inevitably impacted on this performance, although the centres remain open for business. A combination of reduced capacity due to workforce shortages, shortages, infection control measures, social distancing and the use of PPE has impacted on the service delivery. In addition, redeployment of theatre, medical and nursing teams, uh, patient consolations and the need for patient testing prior to surgery has further reduced performance delivery. As a second COVID surge and associated winter pressures continue to impact on all areas of service delivery, cataract day procedure centres will continue to play their part in reducing waiting lists. It is anticipated that where other elective surgeries may need to be downturned in acute hospital sites during the second surge, the day procedure units will continue to act as a resource uh, for the region. 
William Irwin. William, William Irwin. Sorry, uh, supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his response? But I am sure the Minister would agree with me that four years waiting time for cataract surgery is totally unacceptable. Um, I would. I have said that many times about the length of our waiting lists um, across all sectors. Um, in the health service, I said that when I took over as Minister. I think that is why it was important that you, ne- you dedicate a new approach at that time, pre-COVID. I actually assigned and aligned £50 million to tackle waiting lists, and cataracts would have been one of those key priorities. COVID overtook that, but I will say to the members, so did the, the underfunding of our health service over the past number of years, which left us in a position where we were seeing ever increasing waiting lists uh, due to an ever decreasing availability of staff and the reduction of staff members. Claire Shogden, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Minister, I had recently written to you in relation to clinical placements for uh, optometrist independent prescribing, um, and I understand there is an issue being able to secure clinical placements right across all uh, uh, professions. Um, could the Minister give me an update on that and see how we um, could potentially take this forward? Because I do believe it could have an impact on waiting lists in a positive way. And, and I thank the member, you know, and again, when she did write to me, it, it's one of those suggestions that come in that isn't about a complaint of what we're doing, it's actually offering a solution or a different way to look at things. So I know that her, her offer on behalf of, of that client body um, has been taken forward and has been advanced through the department. Uh, Colin McGrath, supplementary. Mr Speaker, would the Minister agree with me that it is a fantastic success story of the Down Hospital and its ability to deliver cataract services, and would he undertake a quick review to see if there are any additional uh, rotas, additional services with cataracts that could be delivered on the site? The staff are willing, they are ready to deliver the service, and if it can be, we would love to deliver those services for the people of the North. Um, and, I, and I thank the Member and welcome to his usual place as the champion of the Down Hospital. I think it is never never an opportunity in this House that he does not excel. The, the, the skill set of the staff and their dedication and it is something that I am highly appreciative of. And as I said in an earlier answer, um, we are continuing to look to see where we, over um, the next couple of months when we get into this second surge where we can deliver our services and deliver them safely. It's, if the down is a footprint that we can use, I am sure that is one that will be explored. Next question, Colin Gilderney. Um, and I, I thank the member for, for his question. Since March 2020, uh, the critical care network has procured 180 intensive care ventilators and 24 advanced patient transport ventilators, and that is to supplement the existing devices in treating our most sick patients. Of these orders, 124 ventilators have been received, allocated and commissioned for use across, across our trusts. The remaining 80, ventil- 80 ventilators are awaited from the supplier, with the order due to be fulfilled by the end of this month. An additional 145 non-invasive ventilation devices have been procured for use by respiratory services in the region, along with 300 high-flow oxygen devices. On the 6th of October, I published individual trust surge plans alongside the Department's surge planning strategic framework. The regional inventory of 348 invasive ventilation devices, which included the 80 expected by the end of uh, October, exceeds the currently anticipated demand. Whilst it is vital that we have necessary ventilators and other equipment in place to meet the needs of the patients, this equipment is unlikely to be a limiting, limiting factor in the provision of critical care to patients in Northern Ireland. The most considerable stress on the health and social care system across comes from pressures on staff resources, including those contracting or self-isolating because of COVID. That is why there is no room for complacency and why we must all play our part in the efforts to control this virus. Colin Giller, new supplementary. Um, Gorham Haggard, and thank you, Minister, for your answer. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the commitment and work of Alex Easton on the Health Committee and to uh, welcome Jonathan to that committee. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the situation we are in today. We have now had 624 deaths as a result of COVID and to pass the condolences on to each and every family who have lost a loved one as a result of this virus. I am acutely conscious that as we stand today, we are now at 95 per cent occupancy rate within the hospital system, and indeed that we have only 16 ICU beds available at this point in time. 
But given the vital importance of access to this vital equipment, including ventilators and ECMO machines, with all the adequately trained staff that are required to operate the, that equipment and, and to deliver that care, can the Minister outline how he intends to ensure accessibility to this vital equipment and care as we move into, to, into this second surge? Um, and again, I thank the member for, for that point. And I think it's one of the, the challenges, but one of the inbuilt solutions that we did produce um, during the first wave, and the, that was the Nightingale uh, facility at the Belfast City Hospital Tower. And in that, by producing that regional model for, for intensification on those patients that needed intensive care and ventilation, um, because during the first wave of COVID-19, those detailed plans were developed to increase our ICU surge capacity in increment, in incremental stages. Um, that was using the Belfast City Hospital Tower and the regional ICU Nightingale facility, and that will continue and has been stood up to be available during future stages. The introduction of social distancing and other measures to control the spread of infection ensured that the numbers of Northern Ireland using this facility did not get close to full capacity in the first wave. The ICU bed usage reached a peak of 96 occupied beds in total, and that included 57 COVID-19 patients. But maintaining services at this level was challenging for ICU staff and required significant redeployment for, from other services. And during future surges, I will not hesitate to recommend, recommend proposals to the executive on reinforcing control measures where necessary to ensure that the HSE does not become overwhelmed. The revised regional ICU surge plan provides the ability to flex capacity to a maximum of 158 ICU beds. But it is important to note that the level of staffing required to deliver this level of ICU capacity would be impossible to sustain for long and would have a major impact on other services, including complex elective surgery. I call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, Minister, no matter how many ventilators you have in order or receive, it doesn't appear that you have enough numbers of staff or trained staff in order to operate those uh, ventilators. Um, so my question to you today is, have you asked for Army medical assistance? Um, should that be necessary in order to facilitate keeping people alive on these ventilators in the worst of this wave? Um, and I thank the, me the member I've said in this House before that when I need to, I not hesitate from, for asking for help from no matter what source it comes from, because it would be a dereliction of my duty as health minister not to do that. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Um, given that we're at the bottom of the league table globally uh, for ICU capacity and warnings were, were made prior to uh, COVID, does the Minister agree with me that more was needed to be done prior uh, to COVID and now to increase our ICU capacity here? Um, and again, and I thank the member. And, you know, I, I keep referring to the Nightingale facility at the Belfast City Hospital Tower. You know, when other places look to, to build temporary hospitals, we utilised the footprint that we had, uh, we utilised the staff that we had, and we produced that on a, on a regional basis. The surge capacity is still there within that uh, facility to go up to 158 ICU beds. That is incrementally. But again, I get back to the point, if we weren't utilising these ICU beds uh, for COVID patients, we could be using them for somewhere, something else and somebody else as well that needed um, needed elective surgery or was using that facility as well. So what I would say, the fewer COVID patients we have coming through, the more our service can actually do. Uh, Jim Allister, I'm a very, very short limited time left. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, when this is over and it comes to reviewing how things were, will that include a review of how well over previous years the department prepared for a pandemic? And will that include a truthful review of how many hospital beds we removed from our system, including ICU beds, over the years. Yeah, and, and the member makes makes that valid point. I think it's something I, you know, I've said in previous answers, um, even here today. It was the reduction of the staff that we had, not the physical beds, uh, but the staff who could maintain those beds and the staff who could look after the patients that needed. Uh, to utilise those beds. So when it does come to that review, I think this place has to be honest and open with what it looks like, the questions it asks, and to, it sees why and what more, uh, actually sees what more we could do for our National Health Service. Because I still maintain, 
that no matter how many people try to denigrate some of the service and some of the delivery that we do, the National Health Service we have here in Northern Ireland and the people working in it is something that we all should be proud of and all should be behind. That ends the period for a list of questions, and we will now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Karen Mullen. Less than 10 schools require PHA contact tracing support for two or more incidents of COVID-19. Um, I, I think some of the support mechanisms that the PHA put into place to support our schools, to allow them to keep open and the, the collaborative approach between ourselves um, and the department, the Department of Education and the Public Health Agency actually got us to a place um, where, although we, I think it was the Education Minister reported uh, 1,500 positive cases, um, I think the reaction and the joint work and actually was a benefit to show how departments actually worked well uh, in a very short space of time in ensuring that those schools could get open and we could support either the, the staff or the, or the pupils who were testing positive and who did get contacted. Carmel, supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. That figure was reported by the Education Minister, but it does not reflect what I know to be the case in Derry. I contacted post primary schools in the city, and between six of them, they had contacted the PHA 55 times with 50 confirmed cases. They have also reported to me that 1,242 pupils are self isolating, yet I could not get that detail. Minister, can you tell me who is responsible for contact tracing within schools? Thank you. Well, again, there was a joint piece of work where schools were, were supporting the contact tracing programme within schools, but also supplemented uh, by the Public Health Agency. Um, the Public Health Agency, as far as I'm aware, supplied information to the Department of Education and the Education Authority on the number of positive cases, the number of outbreaks as well, which allowed the, the Education Minister to provide that information yesterday. In regards to the specific details of how contact tracing worked within schools, I think during this two-week period, there needs to be an intensive piece of work done to make sure that we can provide uh, a safe space for our schools to get back, but also a supportive nature for those principals and teachers who want to get back and educate, educate our children in a safe environment as well. I call Robbie Butler. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask the Minister, is there any evidence to show that the virus is more likely to be spread in nationalist areas than unionist areas? Um, it's not evidence that uh, it's not evidence that we hold um, within the department. Uh, what we do look at and what we do provide is a breakdown of incidents per council area, and now by by postcode as well. Something we don't do is ask anybody who's contracted COVID-19 their political or religious affiliations. Robbie Butler, supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister further agree with me that it is essential that retaining public confidence in such a crisis is essential? And at times like this, all executive ministers should ensure when they speak in public that they are doing so on the basis of fact rather than generalisations. Um, Ask the Minister to agree. I, th I think one of the things that, that we all have to do. That everybody has to be treated with respect. There should be no talking from a sedentary position. Ministers on his feet have respect for let the minister respond to the member's question. Thank you. Um, you know, and I, I thank the member for a supplementary, but I think the crucial point that he got to there was that for this place, um, for Northern Ireland, to get back to where we were um, after the first surge of COVID 19, we have to do it jointly. We have to do it as one society, we have to do it as one, one assembly, and we have to do it as one executive. Um, so it's vitally important that the health message that is put out is consistent, because any weakening or undermining of that, that message does give succour to those who, who don't believe, don't want to believe, and want to undermine for the sake of wanting to undermine uh, what is a vital message, what is something that we have to jointly come together to do, to support our health service, to support those frontline workers uh, as they support patients who contract COVID. Our nursing staff, our doctors, our, hotel, our hospital porters don't care what religion or what political affiliation their patients have, nor does COVID. And I think that's the critical point we need to get through uh, to anyone listening, that this, this virus is no respecter of political persuasion, religious belief, or economic or social background as well. It's an equal opportunities killer, I think, as our party leader referred to. I call Jonathan Buckley. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, given the huge impact lockdown and restriction measures has had on livelihoods across Northern Ireland, there is rightly a strong demand from the public for the factual data regarding transmission spread across the hospitality and other close contact services. Can I ask the Minister, will he provide this House and indeed the wider public with this crucial data? It is only right that those that we are asking to face the brunt of the restrictions that are there provided with the evidence that led to their closures. Thank you. Um, I, I thank the member for his point. Uh, this afternoon there will be a section on my department's website that publishes evidence and data and scientific evidence uh, that we have received, also that we have provided to the executive, and that will be supplemented and updated mm -hmm. as the time goes on with more detailed breakdown. Supplementary, Jonathan Buckley. I thank the Minister for his answer, and it is important that this House gains that information as soon as possible to help inform the general public. Does the Minister share the concerns of many working people across this country who fear the losses of their jobs and businesses and the knock-on mental and personal physical well-being during this crisis? Uh, I, I do, um, and I don't think it's something that should be even questioned. Uh, it's something that I actually welcomed and something that I highlighted um, when the executive unanimously endorsed the steps that uh, we took in regards to the, the, the restrictions for the four weeks and the extended holiday period um, for schools for two weeks. It was uh, a unanimous executive decision because we recognised the difficulties that taking those steps, making those decisions had across the whole of Northern Ireland society. From the impact that COVID-19 was having on our health service, on the, on the economy, on, on even social interactions within our children, within wider society as well. So it wasn't a decision that the executive took lightly, but it was one that the executive took unanimously. And it was one that Lynn here last Wednesday morning, the First Minister moved on behalf of the executive. And I was, um, I was in the chamber to support her uh, in making those recommendations because as, a, as an executive, we realised what had to be done and what has to be done. And what we did um, last week uh, has now proven that other areas are now following. We've seen the actions taken in the Republic of Ireland, we've seen actions now in Wales, and we're seeing actions being taken over greater parts of, of England as well. And Scotland, I'm sure, will be taking steps um, shortly in the same direction. Because what we can't afford in Northern Ireland is what we're seeing already elsewhere across Europe, where we're actually seeing, I think it was the Health Minister in Belgium, had said um, coronavirus had now got out of control within their country, and that's not something that I, as Health Minister, want to stand up here and have to say. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, it is regrettable that the health protection regulations which govern the newest restrictions only commenced at 10.30pm on Friday evening, four and a half hours later than they were due to come into effect. Can the Minister explain why the regs did not commence until 1030 given that the First Minister had announced these restrictions two days previous? Um, the member asked, asked a, a very valid question, and to answer simply, these were regulations that were supportive of a, a five-party agreement, uh, a five-party plan that, that came together earlier in the week. The implementation, the drafting, and the detail of those regulations um, was, as anybody who has any experience in drafting regulations, um, more complicated and more more diverse and more intricate um, than, than first, first envisaged because they weren't a simple, simple copy and paste of the first lockdown restrictions. They were more nuanced, they were more detailed and they were more targeted in the areas where, where we thought action needed to be taken. Clare Sogden, supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. Um, information also appeared on the uh, Northern Ireland Direct website and the Department of Health saying that bowling alleys had to close as well as the other uh, listed businesses. However, the statutory rules, which were published then on Friday night and, and the regulations subsequently published on Sunday night, make no mention of this. Will the Minister put on record for me so that I can advise my constituents if bowling alleys have to close as part of the new restrictions? Um, my understanding is that there is include bowling, bowling alley, alleys as well, but I will get that in writing to the member so she has it as well, not just in Hansard, but also in writing as well. I call Andy Allen. 
in recent weeks have we seen the increase in the number of patients admitted to hospital and ICU as a consequence of COVID-19. Can the Minister advise if he's satisfied that we have the, the doctors, the nurses, the, the anaesthetists uh, and the wider workforce to deal with the, the level of admissions? Um, I, I will say to the member that, that we do have that workforce, um, but the only reason that we have that workforce is we have to take it um, from elsewhere. That's not something that's ready available, or can we, we can simply divert from, 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 from a standing stock of, of health service professionals who are waiting. One of the things that we have done as well is to put out again our, our workforce appeal in regards to anybody who holds those skill sets that they should come forward, uh, or they'd be more than uh, more than happily accepted into the workforce appeal. Um, and uh, we, we published that a couple of weeks ago, and so far that appeal has, has received over 1,700 uh, people who have been successful in their applications for work. And out of that 1,700 people, nearly 900 have been appointed and are deployed in the service um, or on standby or on bank jobs. Andy Allen, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and Minister, as you've highlighted, uh, as we see the increase in admissions in ICU, uh, admissions also uh, that puts pressure on, on our health service and impacts on other services. Minister, would you agree with me that the appalling actions of some should not be a benchmark for the rest of our wider society? Um, very much so. And, and I think one of. I, I can say as much as I want from from this dispatch box in that regard, but I think when anyone has spoken um, either to someone who has suffered from COVID or someone who has lost someone from COVID, um, they give the most powerful uh, testimony as to the effect um, of, of this virus and the impact it has, has on our health service. But what I will also say to the members, one of, one of the most moving, uh, I think, realistic stories of, of experiences of those people who have to utilise ICU and ventilations was actually, I think, one of the testimonies the member himself gave at one point as somebody who has experienced that uh, and come through it as well, because I think, coming from his experience, it's not something that he would want anyone um, in Northern Ireland society to have to go through um, in regards to, to why that is, but especially from COVID and especially in what we're seeing now and what has turned as long COVID and the after effects of, of infection. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he has established an effective fit-for-purpose COVID test and trace system with adequate backward tracing capacity for the people of Northern Ireland? Um, and I, I, th I thank the member. The, the test and trace facility that we, that we have in place is always subject to review um, and improvement. Uh, we have introduced Digital First in, in the last number of weeks, which involved uh, sending those who had tested positive um, text messages. That was then followed up by anybody who, who was able to, but doing a self-certification um, using a, an on-site on website. Uh, we've established our COVID NI app, which puts out data as well. Um, one of the things that we have been doing is going back 48 hours, but it's something, and I think uh, the party, uh, the member's party leader and the health spokesperson as well has also experienced and, and brought, to, brought to attention the usefulness of going back seven days. Uh, rather than simple 48 hours. We have run a pilot, and as we, I suppose, strengthen the service that our test and trace uh, facility does provide, it's something that we're looking to introduce and embed. Chris Little, I'm with Farry, I have a minute left. Thank you. Okay. Uh, does, does the Health Minister accept that uh, a failure to establish adequate backward training capacity in the test and trace system is costing Northern Ireland increased transmission and infection? As I think I just answered the member in the first section, it's something that we've looked at because it's something that has been raised uh, by the member's party leader and the health spokesperson in regards to not just come back um, the 48 hours, but also come back for seven days. One of the challenges then is actually people's uh, ability to remember where they've been seven days before and who they've been in contact. Um, so that's where it starts to put additional challenges onto that program as you expand that backward tracing as well. That's something we've seen from our online system as well, where it's um, an easier facilitation, an easier system to use if you're sitting uh, in front of a computer screen and you come back to it several times rather than simply doing it over a single telephone call. And time is up. And could members take a moment or two to prepare their room? 
Amber.